Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. I've just rested, having a cup of tea, been out preaching and uh, tired. So I'm just having a cup of tea and hope everybody's okay. So, <laughs> so it's good to be with you today. And I uh, hope everybody's okay. We're going to have a Bible study. The Bible study was given at Hayward Reformed Fellowship. And we're just a small group of people who are doing Bible study and teaching together. And a great bunch of people were having some really, really special times. But it's been a good time. We've been out uh, in the streets of Manchester today. And we have recordings of these uh, outings. And uh, someone was recording today. We, and hopefully in the next day or two we should be able to upload some material so hopefully you can see some of the things that's going on. Oh, we've had a, a good team today. Uh, we got a, an amplifying system today which cost over £100, uh, about £140 so, or in total. So we were blasting it out today. We had a good team with us today. And uh, we need more and more helpers. We need more people to come down and help. We need people to be there to support us, to encourage us. Uh, there was about five of us today, maybe six, maybe even more. Um, but we need more people. We need more people who want to reach out. We need more people who, who want to support us, stand with us in prayer, stand with us in, in preaching. There was a, uh, a lady from my seminary, a Chinese lady who supported me and, and gave me the money to buy uh, this amplifying system and my friend. Uh, another friend helping me uh, to pay for it as well. So people were supporting uh, to get the material to be able to use a mic and, and amplifying system. So God's good. But it's all for his glory and it's his work. And we, we need your support. We need your help. We need you to get out with us. Uh, you know, if you know your Bible and you want to reach out, whether you're young, whether you're old, we're in Piccadilly gardens or on market street or if it's raining we go under the food court and uh, sometimes i take my table out with this amplifying system i'll take my stepmothers and the amplifying system if i can get some people to come down with me we'll take the table and the amp and all the rest of the stuff so come down you know if you've got any bibles in home or literature at home bring it down come and see you go on to my website jasonburnspreacher.com jasonburnspreacher.com and, and, and give me a, a text if you want to come down if you've got a heart to reach the lost text me uh, and uh, we'll tell you the details of when we're out next or whenever we're out wherever we are we're planning this year to go to London there's a friend of mine who would like to go to London to heart speaker's corner and uh, also we would like to uh, go to Liverpool so maybe next week we're going to go to Liverpool so God's good uh, you know there are different places we want to get to but uh, the work in Manchester is going great we've got a good team a good team of people from different churches different backgrounds and it's tremendous it was a tough day today the weather was cold I'm feeling a little bit tired um, was out this morning early this morning and uh, We've been preaching uh, all afternoon, and uh, I had a couple of conversations with some Muslims, and I had one chat with an atheist, and uh, I don't know quite where he was at really, but uh, we I was able to share with him uh, some evidences uh, of the Christian faith. I shared with him evidence for the resurrection, and I asked him some pertinent questions. And he found them difficult to answer. So, I mean, <clears throat> here's a question for you skeptics out there. Um, if you could answer me this, please. Why is it women were used as the first witnesses of the gospel? If uh, the gospel is a made-up myth, why use women? Because a woman's testimony in those days was worth half the testimony of a man. So you wouldn't start a religion with women. Yet Jesus was proclaimed first by women. So can you explain to me that? Explain to me the formation of the church worshipping on a Sunday. Why were they worshipping on a Sunday and not on a Saturday? Can you give me some kind of 
sociological uh, explanation of that. Thirdly, where was the body? Why didn't the enemies of Jesus bring out the body? Could any skeptic tell me that, please? If it's not true, why would the disciples go and preach in Jerusalem if they knew that he was dead and his body was just in a tomb? Because they know that that body could have been provided and their beliefs would have been stamped out in minutes. And if that body was in a tomb, why didn't the Sahindrin or the Roman uh, governors bring it out? And they could have silenced Christianity in five minutes, but they didn't. So tell me why. One of the great... Uh, I'll just have a cup of tea, forgive me. I'm just relaxing for a few minutes and then we'll get on with the Bible study and we'll get on with some other stuff. <clears throat> so, you want to get the audience together? If you're interested in Bible study, we're going to have a really good Bible study later on. And, uh, yeah, so I'm just chilling out. I'm just having my cup of tea. I've just come in. So the question that so those are some questions that I'd like skeptics to answer if you can answer them. Be very grateful. I asked the questions to this guy, this atheist guy, and he couldn't answer them. One of the things that I find with skeptics that they, they don't like is they don't like to consider their own particular position. You know, if a skeptic comes along and and, and, and says there are contradictions in the Bible. If they could show that, that would deconstruct Christianity. But they, they of course, can't show those contradictions. But they, if they could, it would prove Christianity wrong. If you could show there were contradictions in the Quran, which is not hard to do, there are contradictions in the Quran, you would destroy the testimony of the Quran. One thing about the skeptics, if we can also do an internal critique of their position, just like they can do an internal critique of our Bible or the Quran. When you do an internal critique of the skeptic's position, there are some major, major contradictions. It doesn't matter whether they're uh, the biggest philosopher in, in the West. It doesn't matter if they're one of the greatest scientists in, in the world. There are, you know, it doesn't matter how clever they are. There will be certain underlying uh, uh, contradictions to their system, and they don't, like, they don't like to be presented with these contradictions. So, for example, one of the contradictions with the skeptics is this. They, they, they argue, and, I, and, and they will not have this. They, they, will, they will fight tooth and nail. They will, one of the things that skeptics like to do is, is they do this. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? They always ask you, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? And they try to wiggle out of the issues by asking, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Uh, in other words, they argue about semantics because they've got nothing. They're so empty and vacuous. They've got really nothing to offer. So you'll find that skeptics will often argue about the meaning of words. And this skeptic, uh, from time to time, said, well, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? But here's the point. Sorry about this. I'm quite tired. Here's the point. You can do an internal critique of the skeptic. And, you know, the atheist will say this. A lot of atheists say this. I've been, I've, I've been studying them for like five, six years, maybe more. And I've studied, I've taught to thousands of them. And I've debated hundreds of them, if not hundreds and hundreds of them. And they, they, they all say this. Well, well atheism, uh, we're all different. You can't say what atheism is. We're all different. Mm. We're all different, are we? Mm. Do you believe that there is no God? Yeah. 
isn't that what atheism is about? Uh, yeah. Well, atheism is about an absence of belief due to a lack of evidence. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure? Of course it is. Right. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but most atheists believe that, don't they? Unless you're going to start being clever and say, oh, well, the Buddhists are atheists. The Buddhists are atheists. Look, you as an atheist don't believe there is a God, and you don't believe there's evidence for it, period. Okay? It's as simple as that. So let's just stick on that with you, yeah? So it's no good wiggling. It's no good saying, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? It's no good. Stick to what your position is, right? We've got your position. Right. So let's do an internal critique of your position. Are you ready? Well, you've got it. You're making a claim, Jay, and you've got to back it up. This is the mantra. This is like the Hare Krishnas. You know Hare Krishnas? Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Hare Krishna. Uh, so then you get the atheist going, you made a claim, so you got to back it up. Uh, you made a claim, so you got to back it up. Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Hare Krishna. You made a claim, so you got to back it up. You made a claim, so you got to back it up. So that's what the atheists do. You made a claim that there's a God, you got to back it up. Okay. Well, let's grant that you are correct in everything that you say. You win the argument, but let's go over to you now. Let's look at your position. Let's do a critique of your position. And that is when the atheists start to skick and scream and jump up and down and try to run away with their ball. And they don't want to play with you, bro. They don't want to play with, you, play with your sister. This is when they get really, really upset. Because when you start to deconstruct the atheist position, when you start to do an internal critique of the atheist, they do not like it. They don't like it. So, uh, so we, we, we do an internal critique. And first of all, we can look at presuppositions and we can look at evidences. But let's look at presuppositions. That's your basic foundation, things that you cannot prove as in evidence, but basic foundations that you're resting on in your argumentation and your evidence against Christianity. So, for example, the presupposition of the beginning of the universe, the presupposition that there is meaning in the universe. He said, well, Jay, there isn't any meaning. Okay, but why are you speaking with meaning? Why are you speaking with meaning? Why are you using meaning if there is no meaning? And that is your irrationalism. You're presupposing meaning when you know that there is no meaning, but yet you're speaking with meaning. It's kind of so schizophrenic. I don't know whether I'm going to go in. In fact, I'm so schizophrenic, I feel I've just taken a pill or drugs, you know. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have it a cake and eat it and you as rationalists want your cake and eat it and I'm sorry whether you believe in existentialism whether you believe in pragmatism whether you believe in postmodernism or modernism whether you're a Gary Edwards who can study and lecture at a higher velocity of philosophy or whether you are making explicit who uh, I don't know what he does but he, he talks a lot about philosophy whether you're an Aussie where, where, it doesn't matter how clever you are whether you're, you're um, whether you're an R and R, whatever. Here's the question: Why are you schizophrenic? Why are you an intellectual schizophrenic? Why are you speaking with meaning and rationality when you cannot account for meaning and rationality in your worldview? And you say, "Well, show us the evidence, Jay. We want the evidence for the Bible. We want the evidence for Jesus. Well, we can give you the evidence, or." you wanted we can give you the evidence but the point is why are you asking for evidence why are you asking for meaning why are you asking for rationality when in your own worldview you've negated rationality and meaning it doesn't make sense but you will pump and skip and jump and dance and you will do everything you can in your power and scream like a little kid to avoid this challenge that you know in your position, there is no meaning to the universe. 
There is no rationality to the universe from your perspective. And yet every day, every time you open your mouth against me or against any Christian, and you argue against the Christian, and you pompously try to show your arguments against the Christian faith, you know that your position is totally founded on irrationalism. I love that video, uh, the Bible thumping wingnut is a great video, where Matt Slick, I think it's one of the last ones recently, last ones of recent, uh, and I love that video where he asked an atheist, there's an atheist with a red t-shirt with a, with a, with a, a pint of beer, right? and the atheist sounds really smart, and really, a really nice guy, and, he, and he's talking away. And Matt Slick asks, asks him, this is on the Bible thumping wing, he asks him, and he says, you know, at the quantum level, when things pop into existence, do they pop in with meaning or no meaning? And this atheist was going, uh, but, 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 but he's skipping and jumping, and what, 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 what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? And this is one of the great cop outs of the skeptics. Well, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? You know, they, they always try to get out of it by asking about meaning. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Another one is you, you don't know what you mean. You're not in touch with the scientific, uh, the, the, you're not in touch with science at the present time. Matt Slick had said that he read. A couple of books on quantum physics and stuff like that so this guy was saying oh you don't know you don't understand you don't understand you don't know and that this is a typical thing that they say typical thing that they do you don't know science you don't know this what do you mean by this what do you mean by that so anyhow uh, Matt Slick wouldn't be perturbed by all this and he said well come on come on but in these things at the quantum level and they pop up do they pop up with meaning or no meaning and eventually the atheist said no meaning so Matt Slick got him and said, well, how can you argue against me and your rationality when you've just admitted that they come to no meaning, that the universe has no meaning? And one of the ironical things is if you use this kind, if you talk like this to a skeptic, they'll say something like, well, your comment's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. Really? Really? It's a very simple question. At the quantum level, when they pop up, do they pop up with no meaning or with meaning? If it's no meaning, your foundation is irrational. If your foundation is irrational, why on earth are you using reason and argumentation and demand reason and evidence from a Christian? You see, in the Christian position, there is a mind that created the universe. And that is why we have a mind and we're able to be rational. So you have the human mind and then you have the mind of God. And the mind of God is rational and we are created in the image of God and that's why we are rational. But if you take that out of the equation and you have nothing which something came from, nothing that something came from, and it's no good going for string theory because string theory doesn't get out of it. If string theory is correct, then the universe is eternal. If the universe is eternal, it would destroy causality. At what point would there be a beginning? At what point would there be a beginning? At what point would there be the end? It, 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 it's irrational. It would destroy the basic foundation of science. Now you can, you know, Gary Edwards is a couple of philosophers there, and they're very uh, clever guys, uh, very, very smart. And they lecture in philosophy. It doesn't matter how clever you are. It doesn't matter how much philosophy you know. You are only flubber-busting. Uh, that's a great word, that. It should be put in the English language. It should be put in the Oxford Dictionary. Flubber-busting. Flubber-busting. It's a word that I've invented. Flubber-busting. Ozzy, you're a flubber-buster. Gary Edwards, you're a flubber-buster. That other philosopher who's a philosopher in, in logic, you're a flubber-buster. And a lot of these atheists on the, on the internet are flubber-busters. They will blind you with science. They will blind you with the philosophy of language. I uh, like throw in loads of deep, deep words and try to make it sound as if they know what they're talking about. When actually a lot of philosophers at the academic level don't even know what they're talking about when they're using the language that you're using and everybody kind of misunderstands everybody else and they don't fully really understand what they're all talking about really. But anyhow, a lot of these skeptics are flubber busters. They are flubber 
flubbusters. Are you a flubbuster today? Where you talk big, a lot of language, a lot of deep philosophical language, a lot of deep scientific language, and it's all deep, and you think you know your stuff, but you're flubbusting. And so no matter how much you flub a bus, it's very, very simple. God says in Romans chapter 1 that you are suppressing the truth in righteousness. You know, deep down as a skeptic, there is a God. You are suppressing the truth. You know it. You know there is a truth. You know that causality that in the scientific method, that causality happens. And you know that. But there is no reason logically that, that you would know that you, that that tomorrow the sun would rise up, tomorrow it could all be turned into blamange, for all you know. But you don't expect the universe to turn to blamange tomorrow. But if there is no meaning, you don't particularly know whether it will be blamange tomorrow. You just don't. But you know that tomorrow the sun will rise. You know it's not going to turn into blamange. Why? Because you're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Because you know that God is making all the laws continue the way they are. And so you know there is a God. And, you know, even Einstein sensed that there was a God. He, he, he talked about the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension. You know, there is another dimension to this universe that, that we don't know of. And that is what you're suppressing. You're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. The dimension is the spiritual dimension. That's the fifth dimension. That God is upholding the universe. Now, it doesn't matter how much I argue with you. It doesn't matter how much we talk about presuppositions. It doesn't matter how much we talk about these things. You are never going to know God until you have your heart changed. Until you're born again. And that's what you need most of all. You need to be born again. You need the Spirit of God. Until God opens your eyes, you're not going to see the truth. It's no good, John McDropout. I've noticed you. You you study, you study, you study, you study, you study. You you're lecturing and talking on uh, Asi Spru, and you'll talk about uh, Van Til, and and some of you skeptics there will go out and try and read Christian books and give critiques as if you know what you're talking about. But it's no good. It's no good. You know why? Because until you're born again, you're never going to see the truth. And you're resisting the truth. You know there is a God. You know there is a truth. And you're lying. You're lying to the public. You're lying to yourself. You are lying when you say there is no God. You are lying when you say there is no evidence for God. You are down and out lying. And you know you're lying. And you don't like a preacher like me telling you that you're lying. You don't like a preacher like me telling you need to trust in the Lord. You don't like a preacher like me to tell you repent. Because you know that you're lying. And when I'm around and preachers are around like me on the internet or around wherever, you don't like it. Because you want your own way. Your own way to live the way you want to live. You see, it doesn't matter how much evidence I give you. It doesn't matter how much I show to you that, that Christianity is true. The end of the day, you want to do it the um, I did it my way brigade. That's what you want to do. I'll do it my way. Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. That's what you want to do. I'll do it my way. I'll live the way I want to do. I'll have sex outside marriage. I'll sleep with five women, ten men. I'll do whatever I want. I'll get blooded at the weekend. I'll spend my money the way I want. I'll do what I want. I will do it my way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, you can't do it your way. I'm your God. I'm your Savior. I'm your Lord. You need to come to me and trust in me and do it my way. And my way is that you need to be saved by the grace of God. So you know there's a truth. You know there is a God. And it doesn't matter how much evidence is provided for you, you are never going to believe, brother or sister. You ain't going to believe. You're never going to believe. So we've looked at presuppositions. We've looked at that, thought about it. If I get onto evidences and talk about evidences, evidences, we could go there, but most of you are not really interested. You're just interested in throwing abuse, interested in causing drama, interested in taking away free people's free speech, interested in all that kind of stuff. 
And if you get serious like an Aussie, or if you get serious like a Gary Edwards, if you get serious like a Christopher Malti, if you get serious like a John Dropout, you will do flubber busting. Flubber busting. Skirting around the edges. Throwing up complicated words. Asking for qualifications of the meaning of words. Flubber busting, flubber busting, flubber busting. You're a flubber buster. Sight an atheist, you are a flubber buster, sir. Oh, and, and, and I just want to say, Sight an atheist has been making a lot of money on merchandise. He's an atheist and he has a YouTube channel and he. He's, making, he's been making loads of money selling t-shirts and tele, selling cups and things like that. And he's been selling cups. And some of those cups he has pictures of me on. I kid you not. I kid you not. It, it wouldn't surprise me he's got t-shirts with me on. I don't know. Or hats with me on. But he, he, he's got, he, he literally, this atheist, Saitan atheist, sells cups. With pictures of me on and, and apparently these cups are selling like hotcakes. I don't know if this is true or not. But the, these these cups have got pictures of me on. And and the question I want to ask Sai Ten Atheist is this. Where's my commission? Where's my commission? Just saying, where's my commission? You know, Trump, he has merchandise. They sell hats and T-shirts on his website with the Trump name, and he gets a commission. Side an atheist, use cups with Jason's name. Jason doesn't get any commission. Doesn't get any commission. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, I, I, I don't get these atheists. I just don't get it. So this atheist literally has a website and sells cups with pictures of me on it. I mean, I don't understand it, but besides an atheist, where's my commission, bro? I, I, if there is a commission, I would encourage you to, to give my commission to the Bible thumping window to, to uh, help him with his show and help him to produce t-shirts and, and whatever. If there is a commission for any cups you've sold with pictures of me on, I don't know what the going rate is for a Christian apologist to have commission for the picture to be on cups. I don't know what the going rate is. But whatever the going rate is, send the commission to Bible Thumping Wingnut and to Matt Slick and uh, let them use that money to help them further their, their uh, gospel proclamation. Yeah, so he, he has these cups where he's got pic pictures of me. I, I, I don't understand it anyway. E by it, lad. Saturn atheist. You're a rum and you, aren't you? You're a rum, lad. Anyhow, what else is there? So, anyhow, we're, we're, so we're on the skeptics and stuff like that. So, so basically, those are some thoughts. And um, I, I'm only doing it tongue in cheek just to, just to make you think as atheist, you know, that. that uh, you, one of the things about the skeptics, most of, 99.9% .9 of the skeptics, there's 1% of skeptic that are met, atheist, that are humble. But 90.9% .9 of skeptics that are met, 90.9% .9 of them, do you know what I've noticed? They think they know it all. That, that honestly, they think, they, 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 they pretend they don't know it all, but they're very opinionated. They're very crotchety. Crotchety. And they're great flubber busters. That's my opinion, anyway. After six years of, of talking to them, I don't know if it's six years or maybe longer. Anyhow, I'm just resting. We'll, we will get on to our Bible study. Sorry about this.
So here we are. It's good to be with you. We're going to get started in a minute. I'm just having a bit of fun there. God is good. So, just um, excuse me. I think we're just going to have a minute, a minute silence. <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to have a, a minute silence for. Um, the families of Brussels, and uh, we're just going to have a moment's quiet just for a minute uh, in respect to the families of Brus those who died in in the Brussels um, thing. So let's just for a minute uh, go quiet in respect to them. Amen. Amen. We're just going to have a time of prayer and then I'll just share about the street preaching again. And uh, So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we give you the prayers and we give you the glory today. Father, I pray for Aaron Rod today. I pray for Satan Atheist. I pray for Live Life 8072. I pray For concordance, I pray for Hoktai Champ, I pray for Alex a Dream, I pray for Jim Gardner and Alex Bottom, I pray for Dr. Hunt, I pray for Hudson, Mr. Hudson. I pray, Father God, for DPR Jones. I pray for negation of P. Pray, Father God, for all these people. Aaron Ra, Thunderfuck, many, many more atheists out there, Lord. I pray for them all. Satan atheist, Lord. And Father, I pray that you touch their hearts. And Lord, I pray that they would know your love. Uh, Cliff Jumper, Lord, and uh, Fiona Robertson, and many, many others. Lord, touch their hearts. May they know your love. May they know your grace. May they know your mercies. May they know your joy. May they know your forgiveness. Father, be with them. Bless them. Show them your grace. Show them your love. Show them that you can save them. Pray for Bernie De Healer. Pray for Matt Delonte. Pray for Dan Barker. Pray to Silverman. Pray for the skeptical community worldwide. Pray, Lord, that they might know your love. Pray that they might know your grace. Pray for Aaron Ra's family, Lord. Bless them. May they all know your love. May they all know your grace. Lord, I pray that I pray for my detractors, my enemies, that they would know your grace, that they would know your love. 
Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you. I pray for all the Christians on YouTube, Lord, that you bless them, every single one of them. May they know your love. May they know your grace. Father, we pray for all the street preachers that are now. Bless them. I pray, Father God, for all the blessings upon this Bible study that we do later on. Bless it, Lord, for your glory. Bless your people, Lord. God, fill us with your love. Forgive me if I'm hard and tough sometimes, Lord. Uh, show, show the love of God to them, Lord. Show me the... Show the love of God to us, Lord. Show the love of God to the skeptic. May they know your love. May they know your grace. May they know your mercy. May they know your blessings, O oh God. Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is our Lord. May you go to him. May you trust in him. Bless them, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 I'm tired. Yeah, we had a good day today. We had a very good day. It was a tough day at the office today, but we had a good team. There was, a, there was quite a few out today. I set up around about 11 o'clock. I was in there. I was in town uh, around about half nine. I went into Costco Coffee and I had a hot chocolate and uh, a chocolate cake. So time to pray. I uh, set up the table, I uh, text the guys, text the team, and uh, a couple came down and gradually came down, and um, there's a lady that took some literature, was very grateful, there was, uh, I think one of the guys talked to about 10 people, a couple of atheists, Etc. I had a chat with a Muslim guy. His Muslim friend didn't want him to talk to me. Kind of left. Um, you know. But the other one wanted to talk. And I was able to share the gospel with him. And. Um, yeah. So. It's been a good day. I'm quite tired. but Okay. We're going to have a Bible study. And. And. Uh, so if you'd like to turn to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, I'm only playing guys and girls out there, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to the skeptics, the skeptics know me, I'm only having a bit of fun, uh, I might seem a bit hard to them, but they know where I'm coming from, they know I'm only having a bit of fun, I, I, I don't give any quarters, I kind of do a Greg Banson on them. But if they met me in reality, I'm quite friendly and, and down to earth and, and very warm. But when I come to skepticism intellectually, I'm quite strong and clear and, and, and forceful in my, in my views. But I respect everybody's opinion. I really do. I believe in free speech for everybody, by the way. I don't care who you are. I believe in free speech for everybody. And, I, and, and if you meet me, you tend to find me. I'm very respectful of other people's opinions. You know, and I will listen to people, and I'm not anti-intellectual. I will talk to you and listen to where you're coming from, whether you're a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a, a Mormon. I had a really good conversation today with some Mormons. It was quite a robust conversation. There was a lady and a guy, and they were quite robust in their in their uh, defense of Mormonism. It was quite interesting. You know, but I, I listened and I gave the Christian perspective and Christian position and. You know, so. So if you turn to uh, John chapter 10, John chapter 10, I'm going to, um, yeah, my, my psoriasis, it's not too bad today, but it's been playing up. It's getting really painful. Really, really painful. It's getting very, very sore at night. It's burning and it's really hurting me. It's really, I put some cream on it, but it's still flaring up it's still burning quite a lot it's really really painful so if you see my psoriasis there if you can see you see there can you see there it's, and, and it's spreading you know it's spreading all all up my arm and it's spreading up here and, it, and it's spreading on my back and it it's very very painful uh, at night it's getting painful in the morning it's getting painful 
and I've tried to I put cream on it. I don't know what the answer is, you know. So if anybody's got any cure or any ideas about psoriasis, so so it's very 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 painful. So if you turn to John chapter ten, John chapter ten. Reading uh, from verse verse twenty five, Jesus answered them and told you, and you believe not the works that I do. My Father's na name they bear witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give them unto eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Excuse me. My Father, which give them, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Say you of him whom the Father hath sanctified, and send into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore. They sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John had first baptized. And there he abode, and many resorted unto him and said, John did no, no miracle, but all things that John spoke of this man were true, and many believed on him there. And many believed on him there. So we'll go to my uh, notes. I've got about eight pages of notes, so. I and my father are one. It's it, round about this time. It, it, it's it's coming to the end of the Lord's public ministry. If you read um, if you read uh, chapter eleven, it's a the next chapter. We have the story of Lazarus. Chapter 12, 13, 14, uh, 15, and 16 are all mainly, I think, in one night, Jesus is teaching. Then in chapter 18, the Lord is arrested. Chapter 19, he's crucified. Chapter 20, he's resurrected. And chapter 21, he reordains <coughs> Peter and rallies the disciples round. But he says, I and my father are one. In verse 30, and I want to ask three questions. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Those three questions are so that you can have something. It's good to have three or four points in a Bible study or a sermon. So people can take it away as, a, as an aid to memory. So th three questions. One is, what does the Lord mean when he says, I and my father are one? Secondly, what does the Lord mean when he quotes Psalm 82? And three, what is his view? What is the Lord's view on Scripture? So those are the three questions. What does the Lord mean when he says, I am my father of one? It's two, what does he mean when he quotes Psalm 82? Three, what does he mean about the Scripture? What does he think about the Scripture? These are the three issues, the questions that we're going to think about in this study. Um, if you turn to John chapter 5, when the Lord says, I am my father and one, you turn to John chapter 5, verse 17. 
John chapter 5, verse 17. Sorry about this. John uh, chapter 5, verse 17. Got quite a few scriptures to, to look at. John chapter 5, verse 17, it says, But Jesus answered them, My father work, worketh, heareth the heareth the control, and I work. So the Father works, and I work. That's not one, just one in purpose. That That's more than that. He's saying that he is God. The Father works, I work. Yeah? Verse, chapter 5, verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. They honor the Father, they must honor me. That is a claim to deity. You turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 53. John chapter 8, verse 53. It says, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead, whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoureth me, of whom you say that he is your Lord. Yet you have not known him, but I know him, and that it is should say, I know him not. I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see me, to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet thirty, fifty years old, hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones, cast at him. But Jesus hid himself, and went out from the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why is it they wanted to stone him? They wanted to stone him because he says, Before Abraham was, I am. He was claiming to be God. And that's why they wanted to stone him. So when the Lord says, I and my Father are one, that is a claim to deity because there are other passages where that comes. If you turn to John chapter 10, sorry about this. If you turn to John chapter 10, verse 39. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. They wanted to kill Jesus. Often they wanted to kill him. Why? Because they knew he was claiming to be God. Now, the Lord spoke in parables, and many of those parables, people couldn't understand them. But he was very, very clear that he was God in the flesh. Very, very clear. That's why they wanted to kill him. If you turn, you know, Scripture shows that Jesus is God. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. Jesus is God with us. That's a claim to deity, friends. Mark chapter 1, verse 7, it says Jesus is the Son of God. That's a claim to deity. If you turn to Luke twenty two seventy, Matthew Mark, Luke twenty two seventy. Luke twenty two seventy, sorry about this. You turn to Luke. Luke twenty two seventy. Luke twenty two seventy. Matthew, Mark, Luke 22, Luke 22, 70. <clears throat> Luke 22, 70. Then said they, O art thou the Son of God? And he said unto them, 
Ye say that I am. Ye say that I am. They said, What need we say further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. So the Lord Jesus said that he was the Son of God. Now the word Son of God in that context has the connotation of divinity that he's connected to the Father. Not just functionally or purpose, but in essence that he is God in the flesh. That's why they wanted to stone him because he was from the Jewish perspective, he was blaspheming. Let's turn to John 19, verse 7. John 19, verse 7. Um, I did a, a big study. I looked at um, the word Son of God in ancient literature, in the um, in the Greek culture, in the Roman culture. Uh, in the Greek and Roman culture, the word Son of God had the connotations of divinity. In Jewish culture, it had the con connotation of viceroy. In I think in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, it had the idea of divinity. And um, but generally, the word "Son of God" has a variety of meanings in the Old and New Testament. But when it's applied to Jesus, the specific context is they saw that as a claim to divinity. All right. So if you turn, excuse me, if you turn to John nineteen seven, John nineteen seven. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. So why has he got to die? Because the Lord made himself out to be the Son of God. They saw that as a blasphemy, a claim to divinity. Now, so they knew the truth. So if you turn to Isaiah 53, if you go to Isaiah 53, it says this, Who had believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So even in Isaiah 53, verse 1, 400 years before Jesus, it's prophesied that the Jews would not see the truth, that they constantly rejected and would not see that he was divine. They knew he was claiming to be divine, but they did not believe that he was divine. Yeah? And even in Isaiah, 400 years before Jesus, it was prophesied that Jesus would be rejected, that they would reject him. You turn to John 3.19. John 3.19. John 3.19. Turn to John 3.19. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. Men love darkness rather than the light. You know, you can say all you want. I want evidence for the Gospels. I want evidence for Jesus. I want evidence. But, my friend, this is what it says, what the Bible says of you. John 3.19. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You don't reject the Christian faith if you're not a believer today. Not because you haven't got the evidence. It's because you prefer darkness rather than light. That's what the Bible says. So if we turn to John chapter 10, verse 37. So, no, I think if we go to uh, John 17, 21, if we turn to John 17, 21. John 17, 21. Now, some people will say, I met a Mormon lady today, and she said the same. When it says John chapter 10, verse 30, and it says, I and my father are one. The skeptic or the Mormons or the witnesses will come and they'll come and quote 
John 17, 21. And say, John chapter 10, 30 doesn't mean that Jesus and the Father are God, that Jesus is God. So if we turn to John 17, verse 21, it says that they all, excuse me, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, what the Lord is saying there is that it's interesting, isn't it? I thought that this is quite interesting that that as we, I and the Father and Father in me, that you be like me. So that's ontological. It's not functional. In other words, you know, a lot of people would say that you know, it, it's on about purpose. I don't think it's on about purpose. Though. I think it's on about dwelling in God. That's just a side issue, but but obviously it's it's not an exact comparison because we we can't be God. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that. We can't be God. We we can't be God. So that's the so that's the passage, and so the argument would be that this proves that John chapter ten. Verse 30 is not about us, uh, about Jesus being God. Because if we can be one with God like, like Jesus is one with the Father, then when it says, I and my Father are one in John 30, it, it, it proves from the, from the Mormon or the Jehovah's Witness point of view that it's not about God. Well, let's go back to John chapter 10. Go back to John chapter 10. And let's look at verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. Now let's go to the verses before and the verses after and see how the verses before and how the verses after define the words. I and my father are one. A friend of mine, a, a, a reformed guy who, who I love very much and he's a good friend, said that, you know, uh, the, the cults take one scripture and they pull it out of context. We as evangelicals take the whole scripture and we compare scripture with scripture. And here we're looking at context. So let's look at context of John chapter 10, verse 30. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and, my, and they follow me. So the Lord saying, my sheep, now he's talking about his sheep. And I give unto them, notice this, I give unto them eternal life. I give unto them eternal life. Jesus gives them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So Jesus is saying, his sheep, he gives life to his sheep, and they will never be plucked out of his hands. Now verse, the next verse. My Father, which gave, gave them, is greater than all. That the Father is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. He's just said, the Lord just said, no one can pluck them out of his hands. And now he's saying, God, the Father, is greater than all, and no one can pluck them out of his Father's hands. If that is not a, a claim to God, Godhood or deity, I don't know what is. And our interpretation, the biblical perspective, our interpretation is now backed up by the reaction of the Jews. What do the Jews do? How do they react to this? Verse 31, then they took up stones again to stone him and answered them, 
many good works have I showed you from my father for which of those works do you stone me verse 33 the Jews answered him saying for a good work we stone thee not but for blasphemy because thou being a man makest thyself God I'm getting tired now they make us thyself God they make us thyself God so the context no one can pluck them out of my hand they're my sheep says Jesus no one can pluck them out of God's hands my hands God's hands synonymous claiming deity that's why the Jews said we're not stoning you for the works that you've done but because you're claiming to be God yeah I'm going to go and get a drink we're going to have a break for a minute and we'll continue the Bible study I hope you're being blessed by it I'm very very tired I've been out all day preaching so forgive me but we'll have a break for a minute I'm going to get a drink and uh, it's good to be with you uh, tired preaching the gospel God is good I'm happy you know I was quite down this morning just a side thing and then we'll get back to the Bible story you know I was quite down today I was quite down this morning quite discouraged but you know as I got into sharing the gospel preaching the gospel praying and encouraging others and others being encouraging me I felt a great joy come upon me it's good to do God's work my friend do God's work and God will bless you all right, I'm going to get a drink. I'll be back in one minute. Okay, God bless you. Don't go away. Go and get a cup of tea. Go and get a drink and come back in a minute. All right, we're still going to go. We've got quite a bit to go yet. God bless you.
Shout out to Phil Fernandez, he's an apologist and was able to send him a message the other day and he sent me a message and uh, Phil Fernandez is a great apologist, a great guy, so thank you sir for uh, sending me the message and uh, may God bless you in all that you do, you're a great guy, absolutely think you're an amazing guy, I love your ministry, love the work that you do bro and uh, continue to do your work uh, brother. That's Phil Fernandez for you. So God bless you, bro. And uh, I sent him a link to Dr. Martin Lord Jones, and he'd read the book Preachers and Preachers. For those who are uh, preachers out there, we, you know, may God bless you. And read Dr. Martin Lord Jones preaching and preachers. If you're a preacher out there, and go and listen to Dr. Martin Lord Jones theories on preachers and preaching, and you'll be really, really blessed. Yeah. And you can get that on Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones Recording Trust. And so, uh, yeah, and go on to Phil Fernandez's website. Uh, just type in Phil Fernandez uh, Biblical Foundation or something, uh, Institute or something, and you'll be blessed on his website. There's also a good article, or his PhD, on the Gordon Clark uh, Van Til controversy. And uh, you might be interested in that, uh, if you're interested in philosophy, it's a bit technical, but it's very interesting. I find it very interesting. I'm just having a five minute break and we'll get back to the Bible study, okay? So forgive me. Just have a break for a minute and God bless you. Go make yourself a cup of tea and uh, come back in a minute. Let me just have a minute break. God bless you. So we had a, a competition for the skeptic, and I, I did ask uh, the atheist community that they would get ten pounds if they could tell me the five best YouTube atheists that I like. Some people have got one or two of the names on the list, but so far nobody's got them all. And nobody has them in the right order. So you got to get all of them. If you get them in the right order, you'll get an extra gift. But so far, nobody's been able to meet the challenge of that. Uh, of being able to do that. So. There's ten pounds in it for someone who can do it, but nobody's been able to do it yet. So maybe one day. But someone got a couple of names on there, but I'm not going to tell you what those names were. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your grace, and we give you the praise and the glory. We give you the honor, Lord. You are our God today. And so, God, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. And, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters today that you bless them. All those who are listed to this Bible study, bless them. Open our eyes, teach us things from your word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 I'm just going to go over there. I need just to do something over there. Okay, I'll just be one second.
Hi there, folks. How they doing? You all right? God's good. Okay, let's get back to the Bible study. So, if you turn to John chapter 10, verse 37. So, we, we've looked at the surrounding context of the text of John 30. What did it mean when the Lord said, I and my Father are one? The one Pentecostals, the Unitarians, the cults like the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons will say that when the Lord says, I and my Father are one, it means purpose. It doesn't mean that he meant God, that Jesus was God. But if you read the surrounding context before and after the text, it kind of clearly states that he is God, very clearly, without any a shadow of doubt there, I don't, I, I think. Now, if you turn to John chapter 10, verse 37. John 10, 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 37. It says, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that I, ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So the Lord is saying, look, I'm claiming to be God. Look at my works. And so they had the works of God before them, and yet they still would not believe. And it comes back to this. No matter how much I prove to you that the Christian faith is true, you or nobody who is a skeptic or from any other position than who don't know the Lord, you're never going to know the Lord until the Lord opens your heart. I can give you all the apologetics that you want. You're never going to come to know the Lord unless the Lord opens your heart. You need to open your heart. You need to repent. You need to trust. But here the Lord is saying, look at my works. My works demonstrate my glory and who I am. So, I want to look at uh, some claims to divinity. So, let's just look at some claims for divinity. I'll just get my notes. Okay. So, when the Lord says, I am my Father, one, are there any verses that show that Jesus is God? So, let's turn to... John 20 verse 8, 28, John 20 verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Romans 9, 5, Romans 9, 5. It says, Whose are the fathers, and of whom are concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. So he's God blessed forever, amen. Revelations 22, 13. Revelations 2, 13. Revelations 2, 13. <clears throat> Revelations 2, 13, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan seats. Sorry, I think I've got that wrong. 16, is it? No, I know I've got that wrong. Sorry. Oh, wait, 22, 13, sorry. 
Revelation, I was in the wrong chapter. Revelation 22. Revelation 22. 13. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You read the Old Testament. The Old Testament says that God is the beginning, the first and the last. And yet it's saying here about Jesus, I am the beginning and the last. If you turn to John chapter 5, verse 23. John chapter 5, verse 23. John chapter 5, verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which sent him. Hmm. So that shows he's God. Okay. got that in a minute we'll come to that in a minute so we, we see the attributes of the father if we turn to Hebrews 13 8 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 Hebrews 13 8. God's good, you know. He does answer prayer. He does answer prayer, you know. He does answer prayer. Anyhow, Hebrews 13 8. I'm trying to find it. Come on, Bible scholars. Hebrews 13 8. We've got it. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday today and forever Jesus Christ yesterday today and forever God is yesterday today forever Jesus is yesterday forever attributes of God eternality then if you turn to Matthew 28 verse 18 or if you turn to uh, Hebrews 1 3 first Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 so it says who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding things by the word of his power, and he laid himself, per perched our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Here it's on about he, who being in the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, upholding all things with his power. That's the attribute of God. God upholds all things. And yet it said of Jesus, he upholds all things. So, if you turn to Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. God has all power. And yet he says, All power. All power is given unto me. Only God has all power. So, I'll just get my notes in the right order. So, 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 Getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. So, so yeah, we don't, we don't need to use them. 
No, no, sorry. Put that back there. That's right. Okay. So, I am my father a one. We've looked at the context, we've looked at other scriptures that show the deity of the Lord. Only a few. We could look at many, many very explicit ones, which we will maybe look at some more in a bit. But that's just to whet your appetite. Let's get back to John chapter 10. So, um, is there anything else on, on that? Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to say about Islam. Um, just to just to um, now the Muslims will say well look you quote the scripture Jesus where Jesus says I am my father and one the Greek says um, James White but he says I am my father and one could be set, could be translated we are one so, um, so that's from James White if you want to go to the Alpha and the Omega Ministries and have a look at that. But now the Muslims will come along and they'll say to you, well look, you claim that Jesus is God. Where in the Bible does he say? He says, clearly using the words, I am God. Where does it say that? Now, the Muslims believe that Jesus had a virgin birth and that Jesus is the Messiah. So you can ask them this question. Where in the Quran does it say Jesus specifically says he is the Messiah where in the Quran does it say that Jesus specifically said I have the virgin birth so by their own criteria they can't answer those questions yet does that not mean does it mean that the Quran doesn't teach that Jesus had a virgin birth that he was the Messiah yeah so you can use that kind of argument to deconstruct the Muslim the issue there is to remember their methodology. Whenever a Muslim comes up to you and asks a question, they're using a methodology and they're trying to squeeze you into the methodology. Don't get tied into the method. You know, turn the method on their own head. Turn it back at them. Another example is when they say to you, you know, Christ, if he's God, then how can God die? Why, why did, if he's flesh, and yet he's supposedly God, then why did he die on a cross? This is what the Muslim will say. How can God die? So they, they've brought a criteria there, and they're bringing it to you, and they're pushing it back on you. So you've got to see that their methodology is the way they're trying to squeeze you, and you can what you do is you take their methodology and you turn it back on them. So you say to them, wait a minute, we believe that, let, let me just think about it before I answer you. Yes, we believe that Jesus is God, but let, let me think about how I can answer you and then come back and then say this to them. Look, you believe the Quran's eternal, do you not? They say, yeah. And you do believe that the Quran became paper. They say, yeah. But the eternal word became paper, yeah. But cannot my, this Quran or your Quran be burnt or decay? They say, yeah. But if it decays, does that mean the eternal word's decayed? And they'll say, no. So well, why can't Jesus' body die but yet the eternal word still exist gotcha yeah so you turn it back on them turn their criteria back on them but be careful when they try to corner you and ask you a question what they're trying what they're doing is they have a criteria a methodology that they're trying to squeeze you into don't play the the game turn that methodology back on them yeah okay just a little note, in Isaiah, um, if you turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 44, verse 6, it says that Jesus is the beginning and the end. Revelation chapter 117, it says that, the first and the last. And if you read the Quran, there are Quranic verses that also say that God is the beginning and the end. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Jesus is the beginning and the end. Uh, sorry, God is the beginning and the end. So in Revelation it says Jesus is the beginning and the end. So you can use those scriptures to show that Jesus is God. Now when you do that, the Muslim will say, well, the Bible's changed. Well, that's another topic. But the point is, is if you read Isaiah 44 verse 6, and there are also Quranic verses that say the same, 
that Jesus is the beginning and the end. Uh, sorry, that God is the beginning and the end. And then you can turn that on its head and say, well, you see, the reason why you need to do this is because the Muslim will always uh, try to wiggle out of it. They'll always say, well, it doesn't say in the Bible that Jesus is God. Show me where it says that Jesus is God. So what you want to do is go to the Bible and say, this is what it says about God, that he is the beginning and the end. Then it says in the Quran that he says that he's the beginning and the end, that God is the beginning and the end. And now it's saying in Revelation 117 that Jesus is the beginning and the end. So why isn't Jesus God? And, and so you corner them then. They, they're not able to maneuver because it's in the Old Testament. It's even in their Quran, and, and you've got them where you want them. So that's just a little bit of uh, information on dealing with Muslims when you're dealing with uh, the divinity of Christ, that Jesus is one with God, that he's one God. Okay, let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. So we've asked the first question, what does it mean when Jesus says, I and my Father are one? It means that Jesus is God. And we've looked at the context of the passage. And then we've looked at some passages that talk about the deity of the Lord. And then we've looked at how to answer Muslims when they say, is Jesus God? Was the Bible teach Jesus is God? Okay. So now I'd like us to go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. So we've got more of, of this. John chapter 10. Are you all right? Are you all right? The brother or sister, are you okay? Don't be discouraged. God is with you. God will carry you through. He'll help you. So don't get down. Don't get discouraged. God will help you. God will make a way for you. He will make a way. You might find it hard. You might find it difficult. But God will make a way for you, brother. He will make a way for you, sister. Trust him. And for you who don't know the Lord, I want to say this to you. Jesus Christ is the most wonderful Savior in the world. Come to know him and trust in him. Find him. Find his peace. Find his mercy. Find his love. Find him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is a good Savior, a wonderful Savior. Turn to him and trust in him and find peace and rest for your soul. Don't kick against the pricks. Don't fight. Don't fight against the faith. Don't fight against the gospel. Don't puff yourself up with your pride. But turn to the Lord and trust in him. Find peace and rest for your soul. Find the love of God in your life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life more abundantly. And he wants to give you abundant life. And he'll give it to you if you trust in him. Okay, let's go to John chapter 10. And we're reading verse 32. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are God's? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and, and the scripture cannot be broken. So notice this now. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Save him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world. Thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. So the Lord is arguing there from the lesser to the greater. He's saying, if you read Psalm 82, it's an indictment on God's people. They should have been helping. Let, let's go to Psalm 82. Let's get a bit of background to it. Let's go. The Lord's in the Solomon porch. He's, he's, he's talking at the time of Hanukkah. They're looking for an earthly deliverer. If you turn to Psalm 82, excuse me. 
Psalm 82. God is good. Psalm 82. Let's go to Psalm 82. God said in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. So he's quoting from this psalm. So he's saying, look, these are the connotations. You are a, a rebellious people. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not whether they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said you are gods. All of you are children of the Most High. So they have a mandate to be like viceroys of God. Then he says, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. You see, they 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 thought they were more than a man. They, they actually thought they were like gods, but they were just flesh. And the Lord is saying, look, if the Lord can call them gods and they were so disobedient, how can you not deny me who is obedient and who claims to be the son of God? An argument from the lesser to the greater. So, so that's what the Lord's doing there, and, he, and he's arguing like that. So that, so what does it mean when the Lord uses this psalm? He's saying, look, like I said, he's saying, look, you are a rebellious house, yet you are called gods in the scripture. How much more me, who is obedient, is to be called the son of God. That's what he's saying. He's not saying there are many gods, but he's just saying, look, if you are called this by God, then what about me, who is obedient? How much more you should believe me? All right? That's what he's saying. Oof, I'm getting, I'm tired, folks. Right. We're near the end now. We're near the end. So if you turn, with, so the first question, what does Jesus mean when he says, I am my father of one? We've looked at that. Second question, what is his understanding? Why is he quoting Psalm 82? We've looked at that. Now, thirdly, and finally, what does the Lord's view of Scripture mean? How does he see Scripture? What does he think of Scripture? Let's have a look what the Lord says. Let's go back to your Bible. Verse 35, verse 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken and the scripture cannot be broken and the scripture cannot be broken. So what is the Greek for broken? What does the Lord mean when he said the scripture cannot be broken? It's a verb, luo, lu, luo, and it has the word diminished, distinguished, eliminated, annihilated. So it does those ideas. So the Lord's saying, the word of God cannot be annihilated. It cannot be eliminated. It cannot be uh, diminished. The scripture cannot be broken. So that's a stark contrast today. There are many in the evangelical church and many uh, in different groups that are diminishing the word of God there are many in evangelical circles that are just taking bits of the scripture to suit their own purposes getting rid of scripture that they don't agree with the on, on homosexuality on, on on what it says about um, men and women roles just put all this stuff under the table and we, we, we don't follow the Bible fully that's even in evangelical circles charismatics often talk about the Rima word and that undermines the Bible because the, the Rima word is not above the word of God. The word of God is above the Rima word. The word of God has teaching that you need to got, get. Yes, the Holy Spirit uh, guides and teaches you, but it's not a new revelation. It's what the Bible says, not your Rima word. This Rima word is like neo-orthodoxy. The Bible doesn't become the word of God because of your Rima word. The Bible is the word of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that enlightens you concerning the Word of God. 
but it's not a new revelation. The Bible is the revelation, complete revelation of God. So the charismatics are dangerous sometimes because they exalt experience above the word. The evangelicals are getting dangerous because they are uh, capitulating to modern culture, listening to culture rather than the word of God. The liberals, as we know, reject inerrancy that the scriptures the Bible says, there's, you know, the, Bible's te the Bible teaches that Scripture cannot err, and the liberals deny this. And you've had over the last uh, 100 years at least, you've had high criticism at the turn of the eight, uh, 19th century. You, you've had that over for 100 years in the West. You've had uh, before that, you've had uh, even in modern times, the last 30 years, an undermining the Scripture by high criticism even more with Boltman and many others. And even today, there are new movements in America where there's an undermining of the Word of God and inerrancy. And one of the terms that people like to use, even evangelicals, is the word infallibility. The Bible is infallible, they say. Infallible in the sense that it can teach us about morality, but it cannot teach us about science. This is quite wrong. Whatever the Bible says is true. Whatever it touches upon is true. On science, philosophy, theology, Whatever the Bible says is true. It's inerrant. It's without error. That's what it means, inerrancy. Infallibility is a weaker term and should be, you should be very careful and ditch it. It's a very dangerous term. Get rid of it and stick to the word inerrancy. Okay? So scripture cannot be broken. So let's turn to Matthew 22, Matthew 22, Matthew 22. Let's look at the Lord's view of Scripture. You see, modern, many of these modern scholars today who disparage the Word of God, ask yourself, is their view the view of the Bible? Is their view the view of Jesus? I don't want a view of the Bible that's not a view from Jesus. If it's from Jesus, I'll believe it. If it's not, I won't believe it. Many, many people are believing the, the views of modern scholars who quit, criticize and say the Bible is not inerrant. And that is dangerous. Matthew 22, uh, 23. Matthew 22, 33. I'm getting very tired now. Matthew 22, 23, 22. Verse 23. Well, the reason why I'm reading the scripture is notice the Lord's use of scripture, what he thinks of scripture, not just the debate that he's involved in, but look at how he sees scripture. Okay. So Matthew 22, verse 23. Then said the same day came to him the Sadducees and said that, There is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? Of the seven, for they shall all had her, had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So he's arguing now from scripture. But the resurrection they neither marry nor eat or are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which has spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham? the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. The Lord argued on this issue with the Pharisees from Scripture. And he argued and said, he, you know, he's not the, the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. Point is, he used Scripture and he never doubted Scripture. His argument was from Scripture. We turn to 
if you turn to uh, Matthew, I think it's Matthew. Um, Put that on there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Sorry, I'm quite tired. I've been out all day. Matthew 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass of one, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall break one of the least of the commandments and all shall teach men to so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be great, called great in the kingdom of heaven. So the Lord is saying, look, not one jot or tittle of the, of the Old Testament shall be replaced. In other words, he's holding fast to the word of God. When the Lord was battling with Satan in the desert, if thou be the Son of God, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Nowhere does the Lord doubt, question, attack, or change the word of God. You have many, many seminary professors today. Many, many seminary professors today deny the word of God, and it's an absolute disgrace. And if you're a seminary professor today, you should get sacked from your seminary position if you don't believe in inerrancy, period. If you don't believe in inerrancy and don't quibble and uh, move about and dance about in your sophisticated theological methodology because you've read a bit of postmodernism or whatever ism is at the moment or some feminist theologian or whatever, and you think you're pretty uh, sophisticated and clever and all the rest of it, you're not sophisticated and clever. You're an idiot if you don't believe the Bible is the word of God, period. You're an absolute idiot. If you, don't, if you claim to be a theologian, if you claim to be a Bible teacher, and you don't teach the Bible as the word of God and inerrant, you are an idiot and you should not be a pastor. You should not be a preacher. You should not even be lecturing in a theological seminary. And the faster that you are sacked from that job, the better. You are a disgrace. An absolute disgrace if you are a theologian and lecturing in a seminary and you don't believe in inerrancy, you should be sacked. And the seminary that does not sack you needs to be closed down. If the seminary will not sack you, that seminary should be shut down. And that seminary is a, an absolute disgrace. And that seminary, the Ichabod, the glory has departed. And it will be a stench in the nostrils of God if that seminary has professors that do not believe in inerrancy. If that seminary is a disgrace. You as a theologian are a disgrace. And you should repent. And you should turn to, to believe what your Lord believes about the Bible. The, he believe, the Lord Jesus never doubted the word of God. He never questioned the word of God. Scripture cannot be broken. And you can mess around and play around all you want with your sophisticated theology. You can quote Hebrew to me. You can quote Greek to me. You can quote the great theologian, uh, Jerem Bars, from Oxford University and say this is all fundamentalism. And we have great massive scholars on my side. I don't care. I don't care if you've got great scholars on your side. I don't care at all. You are an anathema to God. You are an anathema to the church. You are a disgrace as a theologian, and you should be ashamed of yourself that you would dare to teach in a seminary and undermine young people's faith because you do not believe the Bible is the full inerrancy of the Word of God. How dare you do that? How dare you teach the Bible? How dare you teach it if you do not believe it? You are sending people to hell. And you should be ashamed of yourself. So I encourage you, theologian. I encourage you, pastor. I encourage you, preacher, that you have a high view of Scripture. Do not undermine it anymore because you are working for Satan. 
you are working for the devil. You're not working for God. I don't care who you are. You can smile at me. You can laugh at me. You can think you're clever. You can think you've got PhDs coming out of your ears. I don't care because I'm speaking God's word. Jesus said, Scripture cannot be broken. So why are you not holding to his position? Why? I'll tell you why. Because scholarship has become your idol. Because you worship at the feet of scholarship. Because you want another PhD at another university or another theological seminary to look up to you and give you adulation. And you want them to say how great you are, how mighty you are. You are a great PhD theologian. You are a doctor this, and you are a doctor that. You go to their seminary or their university and you give your lecture and they'll clap and applaud you. Oh, bravo. Oh, the nuances of his intellect, the nuances of his scholarship. Bravo, bravo, bravo. And all you're doing is sending yourself to hell. You're the stench in the nostrils of God and you're sending young people to hell with your stinking, dirty, wicked, vile scholarship that you claim to be sophisticated, that you think is accepted in modern academia, but it stenches in the nostrils of God and he absolutely hates it because you're undermining his word and his word says this, scripture cannot be broken. I don't care if you are the top theologian in the in Marburg. I don't care if you're the top theologian at Oxford or Cambridge. I don't care if you're the top theologian of Princeton Theological Seminary. You are a stench in the nostrils of God. You are a stench to, to, to the church when you don't believe the word of God is God's word. When you don't believe what the Lord Jesus Christ said about the word of God. He said, he said, scripture cannot be broken. So who are you? Who are you? Who are you to change that which the Lord has said? Who are you to deny the authority of the Son of God? Who are you to stand against the Son of God? With all your PhDs, with all your learning, you will never ever know more than the Son of God. You will never know more than the Son of God. So how dare you? How dare you go into a seminary and lecture stinking, wicked, vile, pathetic philosophy rather than the pure, holy glorious wonderful word of god building people up strong and mighty in the scriptures and like apollos mighty in the scriptures and sending young people out mighty in the scriptures but you're poisoning their minds with your pathetic scholarship that you have spent years and years perfecting with all your nuances and all your clever questions that maybe other people have not thought about but you're a stench in the nostrils of God. And you need to repent. Go and read Gresham Machen. Go and read Robert Dick Wilson. Go and read Charles Hodge. Go and read B.B. Warfield. Go and read Ardell Dabney. Go and read Charles Spurgeon. Go and read Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Go and read Albert Muller. Go and read these theologians and preachers and get into good, solid, biblical teaching. You don't like it. You're the feminist theologian. You're the postmodernist theologian. And you don't like it. Do you know something? Tough. 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 I don't care if you don't like it. Tough. Tough. Because I tell you what, brother. I tell you what, sister. Mrs. Theologian, who's a feminist. Miss, Mr. Theologian, who's a postmodernist. I tell you this. The people of God will not pass away. Because God said this. Jesus said this. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And when all your silly, stupid, pathetic, vile, postmodern philosophy, your vile, postmodern feminism and all the rest of it, all these sophisticated theologies will go. They'll be a fad. They'll be forgotten. But you know what? The word of God abides. And the people of God abide in the word of God. And there will be. Until the Lord comes back, a remnant that will preach the word, that will teach the word, that will proclaim the word. While well, your silly, stupid ideas will be forgotten. And another theologian will come along who thinks he or she is clever and write a book. And they'll be the number one person on the block. They'll be the one they're adulating. And your ideas will be long forgotten. But you know what? 
There'll be Spurgeons. There'll be Dr. Martin Lord Jones. There'll be great men and women of the word preaching the word of God. And they won't be forgotten because they're standing on the word of God. They tried to crush Charles Spurgeon. They tried to break Charles Spurgeon. They tried to destroy Charles Spurgeon with all their clever, sophisticated ideas. But he still is remembered today as a mighty man of God. Why? Because he stood his foundation on the pure, holy word of God. Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. We stand on that. I've read your postmodernism philosophers. I've read your postmodernist theologians. I've read your th feminist theologians. I've read them. And I tell you this. Give me the simple, pure word of God every time because it feeds my soul. It enriches my heart. It shows me the way to heaven. It rebukes me. It chastises me. It shows me my sin and shows me my Savior and gives me hope and shows me how I can walk and know the living, walk with and know the living God. Amen. Scripture cannot be broken. And you young people out there, you might not like what I've said. You might be pulling your face and saying, I don't like your attitude. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I don't like You know why you don't like it? I'll tell you why. Because you're a rebel. Because you're so full of yourself and you're so full of your own opinion and what you want to do. And you need to buckle under and bow the knee to God and bow the knee to his word and look to his word rather than look to secularism that isn't going anywhere or looking at religion that isn't going anywhere or philosophy that isn't going anywhere. Look to the word of God. Trust in the word of God for it is the way to salvation. It will show you the truth of God and how to know the living God, my friend. So we come to the end. Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. I'm very strong, but we need strong voices today. Don't mess me about with your sophisticated ideas. I've read your sophisticated ideas. I've read your books and all the rest of it. But I want the pure simplicity of the word of God. It feeds my soul. And the church needs preachers that preach the pure simplicity of the gospel and the pure word of God. That's what we need at this time. We don't need your sophisticated ideas. We need the simplicity of the gospel. We need the pure word of God. That's what we need. People need to be fed the finest of wheat. They need to be fed the word of God. That's what they need. That's what they need. And that's what we're aiming to do. Feed people the pure word of God. That's what we're doing here. Feeding you the word of God. You, you, you might say, well, Jay, you're so strong. Do you know why I'm strong? Do you know why I'm strong? Because the enemies of the gospel are even stronger. We're talking of thousands, thousands of theologians, thousands of academics that will deny the word of God. So I have to be strong. I have to be strong to show you a different way, to go against all that ungodly tide. You need a strong voice, a voice that cries in the wilderness. Don't go their way. Go the way of the word. Go the way of the word. Go the way of the word. Okay? Last scripture, and then we're finished, and we're going to pray. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 19. We've looked at the deity of Christ. We looked at, I am my father of one. Then we looked at Psalm 82, the Lord's quotation of that. And looked, what did he mean by that? And then we've looked at scripture in inerrancy. And like I said, in modern culture today, you know, many, many theologians, many, many pastors are denying the inerrancy of, of Scripture, that Scripture cannot err. They're denying that. They're saying that Scripture can err, that it can get it wrong in science. It can get it wrong in morality. And a lot of theologians, a lot of pastors, even in evangelical circles, are coming up with these ideas. And I want to say to you, what position are you taking? Their position, or when the Lord says, Scripture cannot be broken, are you trusting what the Lord says rather than what these people are saying? All right. All right. God bless you. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Our final scripture. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 12 and 19 
and then we're, we're nearly finished, and then I'll have a break for a minute, and we'll finish off in the evening. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 19. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 19. Giving thanks to the Father which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who delivered us from the power of darkness that translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It was the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, this is about Jesus, all things, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, or all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So there is a reference to Jesus being the creator. And then if we turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not some of the of the of the fullness not some of the fullness of god not a bit of the fullness of god not some of the fullness of god but all the fullness of god dwelleth in him bodily all that is a reference to jesus being god all the fullness of god dwells in him bodily and when the lord says i am my father of one that's what he means so we're going to have a break for a minute but I'm going to close this time. That was a Bible study. A bit confrontational, I know, but I, I just wanted to be strong with those, those theologians and pastors who play around with God's Word. You, you need challenging, and, and you need to be told. You need to be told, and I'm telling you right now, you stop it. You stop teaching people heresy and, and teach people the right truth and the right way because people need the word of God so let's come before the Lord I'm going to pray and then I'm going to get a drink and then uh, we might have a few minutes just talking about whatever's happening and whatever's going on in the world and stuff and we'll just have a break okay let's pray Lord Jesus Christ we come before you today and we acknowledge our guilt to you today Lord we acknowledge our sin I am my father of one. Scripture cannot be broken. Lord, forgive us if we've not trusted in your word as we should. Forgive us if we've not upheld your word as we should. Forgive us if we pick and mix. and Forgive us if we don't honor your word and study it as we should. Forgive us our pride and our sin. Forgive us if, we, if we've not worshipped you, Lord, when it says, I am my father of one, if we've not given you the honor and the glory that you deserve. Father, I confess every sin in my life. Any thoughts, anything that's not right, anything that displeases you, Father, forgive me. Forgive us all, Lord. Wash us and cleanse us and have mercy upon us, O oh God. Show us your grace, show us your mercy. Those that don't know you today, even these people who are teaching wrong things, Father, open their eyes. May they turn to you. May those who heard your gospel today through many deeds, through discussion. Oh, God, may you touch their hearts. May you touch them, Lord. Work in their hearts. Bring them home, Father. We give you the prayers and the glory today. And we pray that you will bless this word today. That people might come to know you as Lord and Savior. May they trust in you today. May they walk with you today. May they love you, Lord. Bless them, we pray. May people come to know you as Lord and Savior. May, Lord, people look to you and trust in you. Lord, we pray this in your name. 
may your people be encouraged today may they be strengthened and may they know the blessings of this video Lord whatever it is for your glory Lord help me to walk in love Lord help us to walk in love in Jesus name Amen there is power power a wonder working power in the blood of the land there is power power a wonder working power in the blood of the land there is joy joy a wonder working joy in the blood of the land there is joy joy a wonder working joy in the blood of the lamb there's peace in jesus today may god bless you today i think we're going to call it a day we've had a bible study um i think i'll just get a drink and come back and we'll have a few more minutes and then we'll go all right god bless you i'll be back in a minute all right Well, folks, hot cross bun. We've come to the end. Hope you've enjoyed the Bible study. It's been a good day for preaching. Pray that God will bless the word. Pray that God will continue to bless us. Come out with us. Come out with us, folks. Come out and share the gospel and get out with us. We've got a good team. We need more people, though. We need Bibles. If you've got any Bibles at home, come and bring them down. We need Bibles. We need your prayers. We need your prayers. So please pray that God will bless. Pray that God will bless and um yeah we need you to stand with us okay so may god bless you may god shine upon you may god bless your families may god be with you in all that you do thank you for coming today hope you've been blessed today uh, and god bless you i'm tired i, I just came in this afternoon uh, this evening and i did this bible study because i did it at the reform uh haywood reform fellowship so uh so i, I when i do that I, I do it on the internet and um, I'm just sharing the the Word of God and I might be strong very too strong at times with these skeptics but you know you sometimes you need just a, ro a robust answer to them and uh, a robust answer to these skeptical theologians I'm here to shepherd the sheep all I want to do the only thing that's in my motive is to teach the Word of God 
That's all I want to do is to share the Word of God. I want people to be encouraged in the Word of God. I want people to be built up in the Word of God, to know the Word of God. That's my passion. That's the thing that really makes me passionate is I just want people to know the Word of God. I want people to know the Word of God, to, to walk in the Word of God. That, that's my passion, brothers and sisters. So pray that God will continue to bless. Pray, pray, pray. Please set up prayer meetings and pray for me. Don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com. Go on my Twitter. You'll get updates. Go on my Facebook. You'll get updates, jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com. That's my website. Loads of good stuff on there. You'll be blessed. Truly you're blessed. Many, many people are getting blessed. Many, many people um, will, will be encouraged. There's so many material Bible teaching, apologetics, all, all tons of stuff that will bless you. The skeptics try to publish my old videos that when I wasn't well and they try to make me look bad. But ignore them. Ignore them. Look to my website, jasonburnspreacher.com. That's where you get into my world get to know me and get to know what I'm all about and I'm just a true person a preacher of the Word of God I don't get into all this drama and I might have a little fun sometimes with the skeptics but I don't get into all this drama and I don't do all this stuff that I used to do because it, it was not of God I wasn't uh, walking in the spirit and um, but there, there was there, God still used it though God still used it and uh, so, you know, watch out for me on the internet. There are a, a, a few people out there on that internet. There are trolls that, that are not nice, so keep an eye on them. And, uh, you know, watch out for me. And uh, But go on my world. My world is my website and my Twitter and my Facebook and my other YouTube channels. On my world, I just want to get people into the Word of God and, and, and into the truth. The skeptics world, they just want to deny me free speech. They won't debate me. You'll find that most atheists these days on the internet won't debate me. They won't debate me because they don't want you to find that I can give you scholarship. They don't want you to find all my scholarship that I've done over the years. And uh, they try to deny me free speech. They try to take over my um, internet profile because they want to deny me my free speech and they that even to this day there is a small minority of uh, skeptics that that are, I don't know if they're mentally ill or something but they're very cruel and they they try to hurt people and they try to hurt me and all I'm trying to do is just preach the word and, and just evangelize and share my faith and I would love to debate people like Dan Courtney, Matt Delonte, people like this Richard Carey, I'm just as qualified as any of these people just as educated, I have a degree in theology from Nazarene Seminary, uh, from Manchester University, studied at MA level. Uh, I, I'm vastly more learned than, say, Richard Carrier when it comes to historical Jesus studies. Yeah, I couldn't get a debate with him. Uh, I couldn't get a debate with uh, some of these skeptics because they, they, they don't want you to see that, that there are people like me that can uh, handle themselves and and debate in a, a very scholarly academic way you see you see the thing is about me I might not be the brightest button on the block I don't pretend to be but the thing about me is we were learnt we were taught to do good scholarship we were taught to, to study and to research and whatever and the skeptics don't want you to see that they don't want you to see that we can study that we can research that we can match them they don't want you to see that so they want to present you as, a, as I'm some kind of YouTube video, and, and so they'll play some of these old videos where I've been silly, uh, and they'll major on that, but their main skeptics, their main debaters, their main arguers don't want to debate me because they know, they're scared, they're frightened. They've always been frightened. You know something, I used to have uh, Aaron Ra, Thunderfoot, DPR Jones, even Matt Delonte regularly regularly contact me not sorry not Matt Delonte you contact me a couple of times but uh, Iron Rath Thunderfoot and DPI Jones used to phone me regularly on Skype and they would hassle me at night phoning me and phoning me all the time it one time uh, Thunderfoot phoned me he was drunk 
and he was slubbering and he was talking to me. You know something? I got into a debate with Thunderfoot. I got into debate with Iron Man and a debate with DPR Jones on the show. Me against them three. And I totally demolished them. From that day, the atheist community decided to take away my free speech. They decided to take over my public profile. Decided to persecute me. Decided to harass me uh, while I was doing street preaching. They decided to do that. And then when they realized how bad they'd been, many of them disintegrated away and left me alone because I wasn't doing that anymore. I was just preaching the gospel. But there were some, there were some that still kept kept it up and even to this day still keep it up. But the thing is that one thing they've always, always kept up, they deny me my free speech. They deny me the freedom to intellectually debate. They don't mind Matt Slick. They don't mind, they don't mind Saitem and Bruggen. But they will not debate me. They will not debate me because they fear me. They're scared of me. Matt Delonte scared of me. Aaron Ra scared of me. Aaron Ra met me in Manchester. And it's not recorded. But when he met me in Manchester, this is one of the major atheist debaters. He came up to me, put his arm around me. And it's not recorded. But I challenged him to a debate there and then on evolution. And he ran as fast as you could say, oopsie doopsie. He did. He ran. He ran. This is one of the major debaters on evolution. Ran. And he was stood at the next to me, and I asked him, debate me. And he ran. I'm, I'm coming in a second now. <laughs> he ran. Matt Delonte, I'll be with you in a sec. Matt Delonte uh, contacted me a few years ago, said he would debate me, and he ran. Dan Corney said he'd debate me, and he ran. They ran. They run. And they, they're, they're full of fear. They've always been full of fear. Always been full of fear. And so they continue to, to, to be fearful and they continue to do the things that they do to ignore uh, good scholarship. That's the problem. Are you okay? Did you have a good day? Was the Bible study good? Yeah? I know I'm, I'm, I'm winding down. I'm winding down. So... But it doesn't matter. I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying preaching. I'm enjoying the church plan. I'm enjoying preaching. And uh, debates take a lot of time, a lot of a lot of time to study. So I'm not enthusiastic about having debates, and I'm not going to be demanding debates. But all I'm saying is this: is that the atheist community are the most anti-intellectual community you will ever ever meet online because when you come to them when you come to me with a degree in theology who comes with impeccable scholarship the liars and the cowards they will not come and debate me the only person that I give any credence to is John McDropper that guy I have respect for he's an atheist and I've talked to him there's another guy, uh, Bernie De Healer. Bernie De Healer, John McDropout. And uh, there's another atheist I, uh, I discussed um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I think the video's called Tag or something like that. And um, it's a four hour video. A psychology student. Uh, those three people are the kind of people that I've got a lot of time for and a lot of respect. But the atheist community at large on, on online and the skeptical community online are the most anti-intellectual, completely dishonest group of people because people who are educated and can debate and discuss, they, they don't really want to engage. They want to marginalize you from the, uh, the debate. But that's up to them. I'm happy. It doesn't matter. Anyhow, uh, yeah, so if you, those who are Christians, don't forget, if you want to come down into Manchester, we need Bibles. It'd be great to see you. 
don't forget my website jasonburnspreacher.com 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 don't forget my twitter and don't forget um um the other channel as well youtube channel <laughs> i haven't forgot Anyway, I'm going to go tired. I hope you've enjoyed the Bible study. Uh, the Word of God. I just love the Word of God. These are my notes. Eight pages of notes. Eight pages of notes. Do you want to laugh? Do you want to laugh? Are you ready? What do you reckon? Eh? <laughs> Professor Burns, <laughs> they're not my glasses, they're somebody in the room here. All right, have a good day. Love to Dusty Seegers, love to Bible Thumping Wingnut, love to Matt Slick. I'm enjoying Matt Slick's discussion. Matt, top man. Saiten Brungate, the more I'm getting to study you, the more I'm getting to understand you, the more I'm getting to respect you. Love you, bro. You're doing a great work. Continue to do your work. Bible thumping wing not love to you. I'm enjoying studying Reformed theology. Don't forget to go and have a look. Tell me what you think of Meredith Kleins. Meredith Kleins uh, is a covenant theologian. Have a study of him. Meredith Kleins, see what you think of him. Uh, so I'm really enjoying that. Don't forget to go to uh, Legionnaire Ministries and there's free lectures there. Excuse me, and I'm really enjoying the lectures on church history by Robert Godfrey. I, like I said, I met him once at Westminster Theological, at uh, Westminster Seminary, at uh, Westminster Chap at the Puritan Conference. And he's a great guy. I just love that guy. He's so humble. He's so gracious. I love him. And he's done a series on early church history, and I'm really enjoying going through that. And then go and listen to the great John Gressner. And I'm enjoying his lectures on the Westminster Confession. Really enjoyable. And then, and then a philosopher, a Christian philosopher who I'm enjoying, is Ronald Nash. I'm going through the history of philosophy in his lectures. Type in Ronald Nash. I think it's Ronald Nash or Donald Nash. But it's Dr. Nash on a philosophy, philosophy course. And uh, if you could Google that and... Um, find uh, Dr. Nash's lectures on the history of philosophy. I, I recently done the pre-Socratics and I'm moving into Plato and Aristotle in the next few weeks and he's done a lot of lectures on them so I mean, I'm going to uh, really look forward to that. Uh, on t In terms of uh, covenant theology, I, I don't know whether I agree fully with Meredith Klein so I'm not saying I agree with everything but I downloaded about 60 or 70 lectures uh, loads of lectures on the Pentateuch, lectures on the Covenant theology, generally speaking. So I'm going to be studying them. And uh, so those are some of the things that I'm studying, and I'm really enjoying. I'm really enjoying John Gressner on the Westminster Confession. I'm really enjoying Robert Godfrey on the early church history. And I'm enjoying Nash, Dr. Nash, on the history of philosophy. I'm really enjoying that. So if you want to study stuff, Go and study on, 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 on those things. That's Legionnaire Ministries. And um, I, I can't remember where you get the... It's a seminary online that you can get uh, Dr. Donald, Ronald or Donald Nash on uh, the history of philosophy and stuff. Oh, and the other thing as well, last thing, and then we finish. Uh, Dr. David Wood of Apologetic 17. Dr. David Wood of Apologetic 17. There's him and a guy called Shamom or somebody, somebody like that. They're in a college or a university, and they, they, give a lot of, they're given a, they gave a lot of seminars, about five, on Islam. And these seminar, uh, seminars are brilliant. They're really, really good. So if you get a chance, go to Apologetic 17 or type in uh, Dr. David Wood lectures on Islam, and... They're in a college, a university, and they're talking, and, and Shaman's there, and these guys know their stuff. They're at, they're just full of scripture. They're full and understand Islam, and they're really, really good, and find it tremendous blessing.
Oh, don't forget to go to the atheist Gary Edwards uh, website. Uh, he's he, I've really I'm I'm not serious. I've I've really enjoyed some of his Google Hangouts. Uh, to be fair, I mean I mentioned him the other week and I was just tongue in cheek. I didn't really mean what I was saying. He um, he's got some really good discussions with Ozzy and another uh, philosopher atheist, and they're really enjoyable. And get down to Bible Thumping Wingnuts uh, YouTube channel because it, they're those are really good. I really enjoy them. There's, uh, you know, when, especially when Max Slick comes on. Um, I really enjoy them. So, really, really good. So, I got to encourage you to go down there. But Legionnaire Ministries and uh, Donald Nash, Ronald Nash on philosophy, really, really good. All right, I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to finish, okay? Don't forget, if you're in the UK, in July is the Grace, uh, Grace to You conference. It's down in London. It's in July. It's a, it's a week of Bible teaching. I think I might be going. Uh, so that's the Grace to You conference. So if you're interested in going down and you want to come down with me, let me know. T tell me what you think. But if you're in the UK, the Grace to You conference is coming up in July. I went to it a couple of years ago, and it was absolutely superb. There were brilliant, brilliant pastors, brilliant Bible teachers. Absolutely brilliant. Loved it. So if you can get down there, go down there, because you'll really be blessed truly truly be blessed and look around in america for the shepherds conference look around for uh southern theological seminary reform theological seminary legion and ministries desiring god ministries look around for any of these groups that are doing conferences because you'll be really really blessed in america especially the legionnaire conferences the desiring god conferences any seminars that are at the master seminary covenant seminary reform theological seminary or uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary would be really, really help to you. Look for the Banner of Truth Conference in the UK and America if you're ministers. And the Banner of Truth Conference for the youth in, a, in the UK and um, as well. But the Banner of Truth Conference for ministers in America and the UK are superb. And you'll be truly, truly blessed. Look out for them. You'll be encouraged, all right? Don't forget also, finally, the Puritans. Go and study the Puritans. Go and read about the Puritans. You know, um, type in John Owen. Go and have a look at him. Type in um, Richard Baxter. Type in uh, John Bunyan. Type in Joe Beakey and what he thinks about the Puritans. Uh, and go and have a study of them. Finally, two preachers I want you to go and listen to. Uh, Matt Chandler, listen to him on marriage. Really, really good. And then finally, David Platt. Pastor David Platt, go and listen to him on mission, and you'll be really encouraged. Those are my sound bites today, and uh, God bless you, and uh, have a lovely day. All right, thanks for listening. This is over and out, Jason. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for family and friends today. Bless them in the name of Jesus, and those who don't know you, bless them. May they know your love and grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a lovely evening. And uh, see you soon. God bless. Bye now.